the double declining balance rate, so the, the straight line rate doubled 40% times the beginning period book value. Uh, the important thing to note here is that the beginning period book value does not include a reduction for scrap value. We're taking the actual full book value at that point. Now each year it's going to decline over time because we're still subtracting out whatever depreciation we had for the prior year. But the big thing to note with double declining balance is we don't account for the uh, salvage value up front. We do have to account for it at, toward the end of the asset's life because there is still a rule in place that we can't adjust below the asset's book value or the below the asset's salvage value. So for 2008, for the first year, we just take 40% times the total cost, 50000 because we haven't depreciated anything up to this point. So the balance at the beginning of the year was indeed 50000 That gives us $20,000 for depreciation. For year two, we're going to take two, uh, to 40% and we're going to multiply it by that year's beginning asset balance. Now it's no longer fifty thousand because we've already reduced that balance by twenty thousand. So now we're down to thirty thousand dollars for the beginning value. So for that year's depreciation, we take forty percent times thirty thousand, and that gives us twelve thousand dollars for depreciation for that year. And then if we were to continue on, you'll see the book value at the end of that year is 18,000 so that's the end of 2009 which is also the beginning of 2010 so for 2010 we take 18,000 times 40 percent to get 7200 and you keep going on and on you just uh, whatever your ending book value is that carries forward to the next year multiply it by 40 percent the depreciation expense here you'll notice drops quite drastically it starts high and it gets low very quickly. The accumulated depreciation goes up in the same uh, amount. So whatever depreciation expense we had for that year, that just adds into accumulated depreciation. And of course, the book value drops by that same amount as well. Now here's where the salvage value comes into play with double declining balance. If you look at this, just our calculations, we ended up depreciating $46,112 which took our, our uh, book value down below the salvage value. It was, it was supposed to be locked in at 5000 We have depreciated below $5,000 if we just did our normal calculations. Just like with units of production, I gave you that example where we may need to adjust that final year. It's the same idea. We need to force that last year so that we, we don't depreciate below the $5,000 salvage value. So we just figure out what do we need to get us exactly to 45000 and that's the amount we're going to use for that year's depreciation. Now if you compare the three methods, we're going to see that straight line, as you can imagine, is a straight line across, the exact same each year. Units of production, or what they're referring to as annual production depreciation, that varies based on the amount of production that year and then uh, double declining balance it drops quite drastically again the key thing to note is that the total depreciation is the same in all of these methods it's just how do we allocate that to the various years the one that probably makes the most sense when you can use it is units of production because the more units you produce the more revenue you're gonna have therefore it makes sense to have more expense to match with it but the problem is you can't always use units of production and the uh, the information you need to do that is a little more in depth than just straight line so that's why most companies just use the simple straight line depreciation so we've talked about a full year depreciation now let's talk about how we would handle partial year depreciation so this is simply where we purchase the asset halfway through the year and we need to record depreciation for just that portion. Or maybe we sold the asset halfway through the year and we need to record depreciation for just that half. It doesn't matter which way it goes. So we want to calculate straight line depreciation on December 31st, 2007 for equipment that we purchased on June 30th, 2007. 
The equipment cost $75,000, had a useful life of 10 years, and an estimated salvage value of $5,000. So what we need to note here is that we purchased it on June 30th. So we have July, August, September, October, November, and December. We have six months of depreciation to record, half of a year. And then we know all of our amount, all of our information to calculate a normal year's depreciation. So that's our starting point. We do calculate a full year depreciation. We need that before we can do anything. So we take $75,000 minus $5,000 salvage value, just like before, and we divide it by the number of years in that asset's life, in this case 10. That gives us $7,000 for the full year, and we want half of that, so we simply multiply 7,000 by 6 twelfths, or 1 half, 50%. And that tells us for that half year, that very first half year, we need $3,500 of depreciation. So nothing too tricky there. Probably the trickiest thing is figuring out what percentage of the year are you dealing with. Here it was an easy six months. If it's, uh, let's say it's June 15th, then you have a little bit more difficult calculation. It's still not that tricky. So we've talked about the depreciation calculation, and we said it was based on two big estimates, the predicted salvage value and the predicted useful life. Because of these two things, the only thing that we knew for sure was the cost, the, other, the third thing we needed, and obviously we had to figure out what method we're using. But because of the fact that we have these two estimates, depreciation overall is an estimate. As we go through the asset's life, let's say we have five years, ten years, either of these estimates, or possibly both of them, may change. We may realize that the salvage value of 5000 is way off base. There's no way it's going to be worth 5000 If it was scrap, for example, if, if it was metal, then maybe the price of that particular metal has either increased or dropped quite a bit. Maybe we realize that it's a, it's a piece of technology, and we're halfway through the asset's life, and that technology is now completely obsolete, or it's on its way to being obsolete. Because of that, our useful life may change. That's fine. It's not a mistake. It's an, a new estimate based on better information. So we have to revise that estimate going forward. That's the key thing. We don't go back and try to correct earlier years because they weren't wrong. They were right based on the information we had at the time. Going forward, we know better information. So that's all that's saying. We're going to revise our depreciation estimate from this point on. So on January 1st, 2004, we purchased equipment that cost 30000 It had a useful life of 10 years, and it had no salvage value. During 2007, so think about this. We've already depreciated for 2004, 5, and 6, three of the 10 years. Now in this fourth year, sometime during 2007, we're going to revise the total useful life to eight years. So we've already used three of those years, four, five, and six, 2004, five, and six, so we have five years left out of this new eight-year life. So sometimes you have to really read through these to figure out what it's trying to tell you. We want to calculate the depreciation expense for the year ended December 31st, 2007 using straight line. Now one thing I want to point out, even though it says during 2007, we're basically saying we have not yet calculated 2007's depreciation, so we're going to use the new information to do so. We're not going to use the old information for part of 2007 and then use new information for the rest. So it really doesn't matter when during 2007 we found this out. The entire year of 2007 is going to get the new calculation. So it's the same concept we have the book value at the date of change. So now we need to know what's left at this point so we know what we need to depreciate from this point on. So book value at the date of change minus the salvage value at the date of change. And in this case, it didn't tell us anything different about salvage value, so it's still zero. Divided by the remaining useful life at the date of change. So the first part we need to figure out is what was our book value at the date of change. We've already depreciated three years, so we don't have that full 30000 left. So let's calculate the first three years under the original estimate, 
To do that, we would take $30,000 asset cost minus zero salvage value. So 30000 divided by 10 years was our original estimate. So that's $3,000 per year that we originally recorded for depreciation. And we did that for three full years. So 3000 times three years is $9,000. That's how much depreciation we originally recorded. So we're only left with 21000 at this point. That's all we have left to depreciate from this point on. Again, minus zero salvage value. We didn't change that. So we're going to divide that 21000 by five years remaining. That gives us a new depreciation of 42000 from this point on. So that would be a debit to depreciation expense for that 42000 and a credit again to accumulated depreciation for that same 42000 or 4200 I'm sorry adding an extra zero there so uh it's the same entry it's just the amount that's changed now here is the excerpt from the balance sheet that I was telling you about we have all of our assets we probably have some current assets up here but now we have the property plant and equipment section so they give us our land and buildings, machinery and equipment, all those long-term fixed assets. They give us a subtotal. And then in this case, in this example, they subtract out accumulated depreciation on one line. So they're saying for all these assets, we have a total accumulated depreciation of 122000 And that gives us the net book value for this property, plant, and equipment. Now, some companies do that. They subtract out accumulated depreciation on one line. Some companies may have a separate accumulated depreciation line for each entry. They're both allowable methods. They would probably have some more detail in the footnotes to the financial statements if they only used one line here. But in any case, we're subtracting that amount out. And that's all we're doing. We're getting the net book value of the, that asset. Now on to stage three, or item three for these assets we have additional purchases that we've made along the way for this asset. We can uh, categorize them into one of two categories, one of two types of expenditures. It could either be an ordinary repair, just something we had to pay. Let's say we have a vehicle, we have to take it in for an oil change every so often. That's just a normal, ordinary repair. It really doesn't add to the asset's life above and beyond what its original life would have been. In other words, that asset's life assumed that you maintained it along the way. So it's not really adding anything to it, it's just maintaining it at its expected level. It doesn't increase the productivity, it uh, maintains the normal operating condition. It's just a normal, minor, ordinary repair. On the other hand, let's say we take that, that vehicle in and we get a complete overhaul of the engine and transmission. That's not ordinary repair or maintenance, we're extending the life. Now that, that has a brand new life because the engine and the transmission are the pieces that generally determine the asset's life to begin with. So if we add a brand new one in there, if we completely overhaul it, it probably added another five or ten years to that asset. So those costs, betterments or extraordinary repairs, those do extend the life or they may extend the productivity. So we're going to capitalize those. We're going to add those in as part of that asset's cost and we're going to start depreciating it out with the new cost going forward. The, with the ordinary repairs and maintenance, we're just going to count them as a normal expense that year. It has nothing to do with the asset. We're just counting it as a normal operating expense. They call that a revenue expenditure because it's immediately offset against that year's revenue. The, uh, the other one, the extraordinary repair, is called a capital expenditure because it's capitalized as part of that capital asset. By the way, the term capital is another uh, way to say fixed asset, property, plant, and equipment. It's just another term for those really long-term assets that last us, last us several years and help us to generate revenue for several years. We've capitalized it. We've converted it into an asset that will spread out over future years. So the last stage of this is disposal of the planned asset. We need to figure out how to get it off of the books, how to record the sale, how to record any cash we may have received, how to record a gain or a loss. So the first step 
is to update your normal depreciation up to the date of disposal because that's normal depreciation you need to know a new net book value at that date of disposal once we have that we journalize the actual disposal of the asset with a few different things that may be needed first of all if we received cash for this sale we're gonna debit cash we have to record the cash we have to remove both the accumulated depreciation and the cost of the asset off of the books they're no longer ours they have to both be taken off the books it's we're basically closing those two accounts out so the accumulated depreciation has generated a credit balance over time we kept it in the credit side so to close it out we debit that for that same we debit it for the whole balance that gets it off of the books the asset that in our example earlier it had a fifty thousand dollar asset cost that's kept that same balance over time it stayed on the debit side so to close it out we need to credit it to zero that account out now we know our debits and credits have to match out have to balance out so it's very likely we're gonna have either a gain or a loss if we have a gain that means we need another credit so we're recording a gain which is very similar to a revenue the only difference is we didn't really earn it by our day-to-day -day operations we earned it by selling a fixed asset we had a gain and it ends up having a similar effect to a revenue on your income statement it gets added in basically to all the revenues it does increase your net income overall and then you could have a loss which is similar to an expense that's if we had to plug in a debit to uh, balance everything out now the way to know that we obviously know we need to balance out so you can figure out if it's going to be a gain or loss that way but another way of thinking about it is compare the cash you received to the net book value of that asset at that point point. and remember net book value is the cost minus accumulated appreciation so if you receive seventy thousand for something that has a book value of sixty thousand that's a good thing that's a gain you receive more cash than you had in book value of course the opposite is true if you received less cash than the book value that's not a good thing that's a loss that means you have to debit uh, the loss if they do happen to match then there is no gain or loss which is very unusual the only way it would be uh, and actually the only way it would happen is if coincidentally our depreciation our decline in book value just so happened to match the decline in fair market value that's not our goal that's not our intent so it seldom happens we're just trying to spread cost out the fair market value might decline more rapidly or less rapidly so let's take a look at some numbers some actual examples on September 30th 2007 Evans company sells a machine that originally cost a hundred thousand now they're selling it for sixty thousand cash we can't just figure a forty thousand uh, dollar loss right there we need to take a look at the book value so the machine was placed in service january first two thousand four it was depreciated using straight line with an estimated salvage value of twenty thousand and a useful life of ten years so the first thing you can notice it had a useful life of ten years but they didn't wait 10 years to sell it they only used it up for 2004 5 and 6 and then three quarters of 2007 and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing saying they have to use it for that entire 10 years things change so what we do first is we update depreciation to the date of disposal now we know we already did three years 2004 5 and 6 but now we're in 2007 we need to update depreciation to that date of disposal so we take one hundred thousand dollars cost the original cost minus the twenty thousand estimated salvage value which tells us we want to depreciate eighty thousand dollars over this life we want to do it over ten years so we get eight thousand dollars per year for our normal depreciation now we're doing partial depreciation here for this last year that we have it nine twelfths of the year nine months out of twelve months in other words seventy five percent of the year three quarters so we take seventy five percent times eight thousand dollars the normal annual depreciation that tells us that this nine months is worth six thousand dollars of depreciation 
So our entry is the same. We debit depreciation expense for that six thousand. We credit accumulated depreciation for six thousand. Now we've updated everything to the date of disposal. Now our book value at this point, that's our goal. We need to get that. We take a hundred thousand dollars cost minus our total accumulated depreciation, which would be three years at the normal eight thousand annual depreciation, plus six thousand dollars for the partial year. So we get a total of thirty thousand dollars. One hundred thousand minus thirty thousand gives us seventy thousand dollars book value. That's what we need to calculate a gain or loss. Remember, if we receive more cash compared with the book value, then it's a gain. If there's less cash than the book value, it's a loss. And if they match up, it's no gain or loss. Our book value was seventy thousand but we only received 60000 so the fair market value declined more rapidly than our depreciable value, our book value. So we have a $10,000 loss. Now one thing I want to point out, even though I've kind of said, hey, a gain's good, a loss is bad, in reality, if we have a loss, that just means that we didn't depreciate enough over that asset's life. We didn't take enough expense to keep up with the fair market value, and that's fine because that wasn't our goal. But that's all we're saying here. One way or the other, we would have had this expense or this loss. Either we have it early on throughout the asset's life, or we have it when we sell the asset. Now, to record the actual disposal, we use those four steps that we talked about earlier. We debit cash for whatever we received, 60000 We credit the, or I'm sorry, we debit the accumulated depreciation for that whatever the balance was, 30000 in this case. Let's jump to the, the credit, the machine. We have to credit the machine to take it off the books. That was the full 100000 And if you just do the math there, we have 90000 debits so far, 100000 credits so far, so we're missing a $10,000 debit. That's where that loss comes into play. So again, two different ways to calculate a gain or loss. So now we're going to talk about some similar items uh, to depreciation. Here we have natural resources. Now earlier I said that land itself is not depreciable, and I mentioned that we're not talking about the minerals in the land, we're not talking about the, the trees on the land, we're talking about the actual land itself. In reality, land often has some of these minerals or these natural resources that we're going to use up over that asset's life. So we, we would separately track those. We would track the land as one asset, and then any of these natural resources would be a separate asset. So the examples they give us are oil, coal, gold. You could have timber, actual trees, anything like that that's on or in the land that we're going to use up. That part does get used up over the asset's life. Even though we called the other reduction in cost, we call it depreciation, when we're dealing with natural resources, we call it depletion. It's the same concept. In fact, it's really identical to units of production depreciation. It's just they use a different term. They call it depletion. We're depleting natural resources. So don't get confused by a different term. I really don't know why they decided to call that something different, but they did. So again, depletion is very similar to units of production depreciation. We take the cost minus the salvage value and divide it by the total units that we think we're going to get out of that asset. That gives us a depletion per unit, and we multiply it by the number of units that we actually did, if you want to call it produce, we extracted from that, that uh, land or that natural resource. So really, again, we've already learned the units of production. It's the exact same for depletion, just a different term. And we have one other section here called an intangible asset. So this is an asset, it is long term, and it does have a value to us, but there's no physical substance. So the term tangible means that we can physically use it, and intangible means that there is no physical substance. We can't really physically use the piece of paper, and we'll find out that's what a an intangible asset is often a legal right, so it's only... Uh, recorded on a piece of paper, you have some sort of contract or some sort of 
legal protection. So you can't physically use that piece of paper and do anything in your operations, but it's certainly valuable for you. It often provides exclusive rights or privileges. We'll talk about copyrights, trademarks, all of those are intangible assets. The useful life is sometimes difficult to determine. It may have a legal life, but the useful life may differ from that. So just a quick example, a uh, patent. That protects us from someone else, someone else stealing our idea and producing our product. It has a legal right or legal life, but let's say uh, we get a patent for some really popular product, but it's only going to be popular for a couple of years. It's a fad. So the useful life, we really don't know. We can estimate that we think we're going to be able to sell this for five years, but as soon as it starts to become unpopular, that patent is pretty much worthless. At that point, nobody would want to copy us because it's not a popular product anymore. So we're still going to spread that cost out over its life. They have yet another term for that. It's called amortization. It's the same idea. In fact, it's just like straight line depreciation, only they use amortization. We're going to record these assets at their cost, which includes if we had to purchase that patent or that uh, trademark, then we'd include the purchase price. We would include any legal fees, any filing fees, anything like that. So here's a list of some examples. Patents, copyrights, leaseholds. Uh, by the way, a leasehold is the right to lease a property for a certain amount of time. The example I like to give here is if you've gone to Vegas, if you go on the Strip, uh, I like to stay at the Flamingo Hotel there. Right behind the Flamingo, and I guess it's, uh, gosh, I'm, my directions are off. I can't think straight there. But just a few blocks off of the Flamingo, off of the Strip, there's a little gas station. And they always have this big sign that says uh, our lease will last for another, like, 20 years. They have a leasehold. They signed a contract a long time ago and they have a lease, they have the right to lease that, that property for so many years, and they keep advertising it. In other words, we're here to stay for at least 20 years. So it's kind of, I always kind of find that kind of, oh, wow, I always find that kind of funny that they put that up there, but that's just an example. A leasehold improvement would be anything that that, that store, that little grocery store or gas station, anything they would happen to add to that property, that becomes a leasehold improvement. If they, uh, I don't know if they add a little shed out back or anything like that. Franchises and licenses. Goodwill. That's when one company buys another company for a price that's higher than the fair market value of all their tangible assets. So in other words, we're paying more for this company than it appears to be worth. That difference must be due to some value that we see in the company that wasn't reported on their balance sheet. So it could be due to a, a trademark, a popular product, a strong management team, anything like that. That would create goodwill. Trademarks and trade names, pretty self-explanatory there. So a patent, we have a 20-year legal right. And again, it's amortized or spread out using the straight line method over its useful life, which may not be that long. It may not be the full 20 years. If it's only going to be a popular product for five years, that becomes its useful life, and it's an estimate. So Matrix Incorporated purchased a patent for 10000 It's expected to have a 10-year useful life. It's the same basic entry, only we use the term amortization. Copyrights, it's the life of the creator or author plus 70 years after they've died. Leasehold, that would be a contract, so you, you know the right there. It's in the contract. And then goodwill I already mentioned. When one company buys another company for a price that's higher than their fair market value, the fair market value of the assets that you can identify. One thing to note about goodwill is that since, I believe, 2001, this has not been amortized. There was a rule change at that point that said we no longer amortize it over a number of years. Instead, we take a look at the value of that company we purchased and see if we still think it's that valuable. Do we think that strong product or that strong management team still has that value? If not, we may we may take a charge or we may reduce the value that year down to what we think it's worth. 
It'd be called an impairment in that value. Now, uh, one thing to note there is that we never adjust back up. We only adjust down and down. It's, it's similar to the idea of lower cost or market. It's a conservative approach. And again, that's all I'll say for that topic. And that takes us to the